Okay. Uh, okay, so the reference material. I'm going to try to upload to its learning. All of you, do all of you have access to its learning? Yeah? Who doesn't have access to its learning? No one? Okay, great. So I'm going to upload all the material, most of the material that you need for the course. Um, but some of the material you might, if you want, I will give you now two references. If you want, you are eager and you want to start already reviewing the literature, that's fine with me. So two of the, of the material that we will use is this book, Hydrocarbon Exploration and Production. Okay, by Jan, Cook and Graham. And the book, some aspects, not all the book, of course, here also not all the book, of uh, Well Performance by uh, Michael Gulan and Curtis Whitson. But I will tell you, I will indicate during the course which, where you should go to which uh, topic, when you should go to each topic. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I think that's all. Uh, the course description also is very um, is very important. Those of you who haven't been to who haven't visited the website of the courses, where is it? Here. Okay. That is ex explaining very clearly what is the course content, what you should expect from this course, what are you going to gain from this course, and also some of the knowledge that you need to have in order to take this course. So I'm not going to go through all of it because we are going to go now do uh, some scope and introduction and, and go through it uh, on the lecture. But just that if you have any doubts, th those of you who want to see in detail or want to ask exactly what is the content of the course, you have it. It's in the NTNU website, but I have printed it for you and put it here on a, on a document. Okay. Yes, so I'm going to attach that to the PDF. Any questions on the formalities of the course? No? Any comment? Suggestion? Anyone wants to sing? No? So my, Michael Golan will not be teaching this course? No, he hasn't teach it for like now, in, now two years. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so the history of this course. This course is very special. You cannot find it almost any other university in the world. Okay. It was founded or created. I think it was in 2004 by Professor Michael Golan, and he was put together kind of a unique assortment of issues. And, uh, but, but really for a very important topic, which is field development and operations. And that's how this course came and developed further. Okay, now I I'm, uh, I'm was uh, uh, hired last year in January. So I'm taking over this course and I'm trying to also to put some new things oriented a bit more to, um, so you will have First, you have a lot of exposure to tools, uh, computational tools, and problems that you will face in the future life in the oil industry. And also to taking over and trying to, to, um, to continue with the same material that he was using. Okay? So just to locate you a bit in where are we or where is this course focused on? Okay, we are first only based, or we are going to look only at the E and P sector of the oil industry, what is called the upstream. Explora e and P st stands for exploration and production. Okay, and that's also called upstream, the upstream sector of the oil industry. That's the the location, the spatial location where this field is focusing on. 
Uh, actually, we're not going to talk too much about exploration, about the E per se. I know that you have a lot of courses in geophysics and I, in reservoir, and I think you have already, I, I think, or I hope that you have already a strong foundation in, uh, in those issues. So we are going to only to go very um, on the edge of all of these, um, of all of this knowledge. But we're going to focus very much on the production part. All the other part, midstream, downstream, that's left for other courses. So you you have to focus already from the beginning. That's where we are going to. That's what we are going to be focused on. How many of you are coming from this institute? Are actually have petroleum background? Uh, yeah. Petroleum background, no reservoir, material, gas material balance. Uh, only four of you. Yeah. Okay, five. Okay, uh, there is some knowledge because this course is, of course, is building, is addressing some things that you are, we are assuming that you already have a lot of previous knowledge on the topic, okay? But don't worry, I will try those things that I will try to introduce from the basic concepts to go to the most complicated, if it doesn't take much time. But if it takes time, Professor Curtis Whitson, he made a YouTube channel with a lot of different topics. So probably I will handpick some of the videos for you to watch before go coming to the lecture, okay? Or if you want to know, for example, some details, where some expression, where some equation came from, you go and yeah, and I will try to direct to this channel and uh, and select a video for you so you can understand. Those of you who don't have the background in in petroleum engineering, okay? So that's the location. Where are we, okay? Okay, so what is this course dealing with? And when, the, loca the temporal location now, when in the life of the field are we located? Or is this course located? Okay, so we have, uh, for that we have to maybe go to another page and call what is called the life cycle of a petroleum asset, okay, of, or of a oil and gas field. And every, every history or every life of a gas, oil and gas fields starts by, we can put them in boxes maybe, so you will have a series of, or a sequence of, of events. So we have pre-exploration. Okay. Then you have the actual exploration. And then you have a found, you have found a hydrocarbon, you have an area that you think that is might be, uh, you're happy because it might contain hydrocarbons. So the next step is to do appraisal, to know exactly, to try to find out how much you have in the subsurface. And then at this point, when you have already enough information, when you have already the best possible picture that you can have of the subsurface is where you take the decision if you want to continue and move forward for development or not. Here is kind of a critical phase of the life of the, of the field and might determine if you go forward with the development or if you just stop there and okay and go and move to some other area or you have to wait and leave it on ice, okay? <clears throat> Well, of course, we have here the exploration and discovery, okay? Forgot to put it. Okay, appraisal, or people also call it delineation. 
Okay, and that's where you take the decision to go further or not. And after you take the decision, you think it's worth to go the extra mile, then you go to the project uh, pre-project phase. Okay, that's where you do all the design and the planning. Design and planning. So let me just put that. And then you have the actual uh, execution of the project. Where is where the wells are drilled, the facilities are commissioned, the facilities are installed, uh, the pipes are connected, etc. And after that, you have the actual uh, operations. Okay. Actual operations. And after that, you have abandonment and decommissioning. Those, in a rough way, or also with some variations, are all the stages of a life of of, uh, of the life of an oil and gas field. Okay. Please know that when you have already, you have to have uh, exploration, discovery, appraisal, etc. But if you don't have, if the people don't decide to go further, actually, you don't have any field. Okay. So it just stops there. It dies there. But what makes it a full field is that people actually decide to go forward with the concept and then. Um, go all the way to operations and at the end to abandon and decommission the, the equipment. Okay, So we're going to focus this uh, particular course is focused on this part. That's where in time of the life of the field we are focused. Uh, we are focused on the pre-project phase. How do you plan? How can you forecast uh, how the field is going to behave in the future? And uh, and then we are going to look at something. So let's put that here. Take it here. Say. <coughs> Field development and operations. So the development part is this part where you have the pre-project, you have to do the evaluation, sensitivity analysis to consider many different um, uh, concepts to develop a field. And also on the project execution, there might be some things that have to be changed in the way. Okay, So in that part is the development part. And then operations. Operations is actually when you are operating the field and you are locked. Uh, there is really actually a very big difference between these two ways of working. One of them, the development, you have, of course, you have a lot of flexibility. Almost many few things are locked in the system. So you can, um, so you can have to try and run sensitivity analysis. Analysis. You have to run sensitivity analysis. Uh, you have there are also some choices we will see just in a moment. There are some uh, uh, choices that are kind of imposed, uh, but there is also a lot of uncertainty. We are not really sure at that stage 
how or how are the reserves what do we have in the subsurface in terms of what are the volumes what are the geological structures that we have uh, what are the the fluids that we will be producing but then when we go to operations so we have to try on after the, all the development process we have to try to come up with some with all the information that we have available with the best system or the best production system to produce the fuel, to produce the asset. With all of these constraints, with all the flexibility, we have to come up with the best way to be able to produce the system. And we also have to plan in advance that if something happened or take care for all the possible unexpected things that, you know, that can happen, to, so it will be possible to cope or we will be possible to cope with all of those issues. While in operations we are already locked or we are stuck in a way with a particular system. <coughs> and then we have to cope with its deficiencies. Okay. But also we have to exploit its advantages. Of course, in this, uh, I forgot to say, in the development, you want also to do some optimization. That means that's this part that I told you that we try to find the best system possible to develop our asset that gives us the, the, the biggest advantages possible. In operations also, we try to do some kind of optimization, but this is trying to, to also to, with the system that you are and the deficiencies that it has, and the problems that you might experience to try to minimize all of these problems to get the most out of the asset with the system that you have. So you also have some degree of optimization. Or we should call it maybe not optimization but effectivization. Okay. So that's where we are in terms of space in the industry and in terms of when. Well, that's where the course is going to focus mainly. And mainly we're going to have some reference, very occasional to onshore fields, but it's going to be mainly for offshore. All of our development, all of our, and also a bit limited or a bit giving some peculiarities of the, of the Norwegian uh, sector. So that's very important focused. on offshore development. And there are two levels. I want just to give you the disclaimer very early that there are two ways the, or two, two scopes that the course is going to take. The course is going to take one that is just to give you an appreciate appreciation, okay, that you have to learn. It's like literature that you read and you get informed and maybe you feel that you will use that information in the future, but it's something that doesn't have to be locked in your brain for, you know, for, for now for, uh, to go with you for the professional life. If you know the information, you're a bit familiar with the information, you use it or not. That's what I call the appreciation level. For example, this of the life of the field, maybe some appreciation information that you might forget even today after some hours, okay? But then we go on the part on the engineering part of the course that I think is the most important and where I want to make uh, emphasis. And that's where the, all the exercises are going to be based. And we are going to try all the time to do calculations, relevant calculations that you know how to do them, okay? And also to do engineering analysis, okay? logical an analysis and engineering analysis and that's something that if you practice you do it yourself that's something that sticks with you when you are you know later in the in the industry okay so let's see
Okay, um, so you have here, I forgot to put some sensitivity analysis, so you calculate some scenarios. You have a lot of uncertainty. Um, yeah, and here a big problem is of effectivization related with the same issue, maintenance and troubleshooting. <coughs> okay. Um, now, for these two things, for, for development and for operations, it's very important to understand the performance of the field. It's, very, it's almost like the, the most critical aspect of these two things. How the field is going to perform and be able to forecast and compute and calculate this performance. So let's see, let's bring a picture of a field. Okay, so let's um, put a picture here of the, a bit better of of the, the life cycle of an oil and gas field. We're going to come back to this in a, in a later lecture, so don't be uh, stressed. <coughs> okay, so uh, the, in either in operations or also in development, you have something very important, which is the revenue and cost profile. I have put it here very simple, but you have, at the beginning, you have to invest a lot of time in facilities, you have to invest a lot of time in design, you have to invest a lot of time in buying actual equipment, and very important, especially for some assets, offshore assets and subsea uh, assets, is the drilling of the wells, drilling and completing the well. That's something that is very heavy, that involves a very heavy cost. Okay. That's all the negative money that you have here, going the sink, going out of your system. And also you have the operation that has to do with the maintenance, replacement of equipment, paying the personnel that you have to have to run the equipment. But all of that is in one part of the scale, okay? The negative part of the scale. The positive is what you get from the income. You get selling the oil and the gas, the hydrocarbon products. And that's extremely important for the value of if that doesn't exist or if that is somehow uh, restricted or is somehow diminished, that's going to cause a big impact I also in operations and also in our development, in the planning of our development. So the main driver of ENP operations is, I guess, all of you are familiar with this term, net present value. Okay, at the end, what, how we evaluate or the best way, not the best way, but the, the way that summarizes all of these complex aspects is the net present value of the project. Okay. And we have some things like the oil price, uh, oil production, capex, which is the capital expenditures, the, the, the cost of the, of the facilities, the operational expenditures, the tax. So let's take a better picture that gives some more details. Can you see okay the pictures from, from the back? Okay, so oil price, as you see, and it's very relevant for today, it's something that can be forecast, but people make a lot of mistakes. Okay, and they can find that they have a situation where the oil price is much less than what they predicted, and that's a science for itself, and we are not here going to talk about, we don't have the expertise, and we are not going to talk about the prediction or the forecast of the oil price. Okay. But that's something, an aspect that is very important in this formula that you have to take into account. Okay. Then comes the, the capex, which are the cost of all the facilities, of all the things that we need actually to put to create the production system. That means, well, actually capex we can separate in drillex, which is the cost of drilling the wells. That's very important. Then the to all the equipment that we need in the case of an offshore field, we need so to have flow lines, we need to have uh, uh, platforms, we need to have uh, uh, FPSO, uh, we need to have separators, all of that is included in the capex. Okay. Then we have the operational expenditures, that the equipment has a, a limited lifetime, or there are problems sometimes that they happen in our production system, and we have 
just to invest some extra money to solve to solve them and continue producing and then we have tax okay. if you see some of these these things I, what I want just to show you what's you know what's influencing the the value of a project but also that there are some things that they are locked or that they they really we cannot do much about them okay if for example we have a field uh, ultra deep offshore in the Gulf of Mexico okay we know that we will have to drill uh, subsea wells okay we know that they are going to be very expensive so we really cannot do much about them we just have to pay and that's all okay and we need we know that we will have to have a, a floater we will have a floating production system and they have certain costs depending on the capacity that you have so really we cannot do much about it okay or on the tax part if we are for example in a in a country where in Norway there are certain legislations that that apply so you cannot go and change them in the in the Ringeringen so you have to stick with them so your many of these aspects are locked but there are some others that are flexible and one of them as i told you in this figure before that is very important is the income okay and the income is the income is directly uh, related to the production profile okay or the performance of the field so this little guy here that we put it here very small that's really what is making a big difference in this mpv so why that's why it's so important and that's defined by the so we can just put it here so that's um, a, the production profile and that's very important that's what defines in a great part the the value of the of the of the field okay uh, and this is defined by the field performance okay. that's why it's so important to understand how the field is going to behave if we are in the development phase, in the field development, we have to be able to forecast so to see how is it going to be in the future in a very accurate way. We know that there is some some limitations. For example, we have we are not sure how many reserves we have and we will never know recoverable reserves until we have depleted the whole field. That's where we will know, OK, the recovery factor was 50, 70, 30 percent. That's where we will know for sure. But we have to there is some so there is some uncertainty but we we have we want to get as accurate as possible the production profile of the field in the development case if we are in the operational side we have to check if what was what was predicted is actually following if what we are pro actually producing is following what we actually predicted okay and if you are not why not okay why we are not producing what we should be producing and also be able to see what will happen from that point in the future because we want to be sure that if we do any investment if we do any change to our system that that will be that will be paid off okay. so we are going to talk the, the economical part taxation maybe we will have we hope to have some uh, guest lecture to talk a bit on on taxation uh, we are going to uh, not too much on the economy uh, on the facilities we're going to discuss a little bit but really our main focus of this course is how to how understand and how to predict field performance if if you do any for example you have to I don't know you add, you add it it can happen you have to be for example they can be expend after the field is in operation okay but actually they are not planned like that if that happens is because for example there was a new development close by and you want to tie it in to your field okay but for that you have for example to put new power more power supply so you have to put a new power generation facility in your platform for example okay like for example if we have discovered a new field mm -hmm. And we are going to develop it, and we are we, we have bought the pipelines, and we are going to connect the pipelines. So connecting the pipeline cost is it is is, is included in the capex in capex. Okay. 
OPEX is only operational expenditures, is what comes from the normal operation of the field. CAPEX is all what you need to install the production to buy, acquire, buy and install the, the, the production system. Okay. Okay, so now let's uh, to go a bit further on that part, and then we will uh, take a break. Because I think you are used to a break, right? Yeah. At least the guys in the numerical course, they were a bit angry with me at the beginning because they didn't give any break. So if I don't, they will be mutiny if I don't give a break this time. Okay, so in a very simplified way, or in a very kind of... Uh, cartoon way that's the field okay so how what what parameters are playing an effect on the performance of the field first in the reservoir we have to see some important factors are so the first one is total recoverable reserve I think that's not a good color Okay, how much do I have down there? Okay, and that's influenced by many things. By and also some other aspect that might be important is initial pressure. Or reservoir characteristics. like permeability, how much is the rock able to give me? How much fluid is it able to, to provide? Reservoir characteristics, initial pressure. If we, for example, see that there is a nice big volume, but then it's not connected, for example. So we have to put a lot of wells to try to reach the different areas. So the geological aspect is very important. Geological Also, the pressure support, how, how the pressure is going to decline with time. How, as we take the, all the material from the reservoir, how is the pressure going to decline with time? Let's say it declines very quickly, so we have to be prepared for that. We don't want that to happen because we have done a lot of investment, and then if it produces very high, and then it begins to drop very quickly, so we don't like that. So we have to be careful with pressure support. Okay, if we have an, uh, an active aquifer, it's very good for oil, but if we have an active aquifer for gas, it's not so good. If we're going to do reinjection or not. Uh, also the fluid characteristics. Something very important that I haven't, we will talk about that just in a second, about the, if it's oil and gas. Oil and gas really makes a very dramatic difference in the development and also in the operation, but more in the development. And we will see very quickly why fluid characteristics and which type if it's an oil characteristics if it's an oil which type of oil is it is it a volatile oil is it a dead oil is it an oil with a lot of gas uh, or if it's a gas if it has the ability to produce a lot of condensate that can change dramatically the the value of a field okay sometimes fields depending on the price of the gas but sometimes fields get a significant part of the income doesn't come from the gas that they are selling, but comes from the condensate that they are recovering from the from the gas. So all of these things we have to take into account from the reservoir side. How do we reach it, and how do we get? Uh, also, how is the connectivity between well and well in the reservoir? That has to do with the geological structures and what we call reservoir communication. Now we go a bit part on the wellbore, and on the wellbore, really, if you think it from a sim from the simplistic point of view, is just a conduit to take the fluid from the reservoir up to the surface. Okay, surface being subsea or surface being to if an onshore field to the, to the, to the surface. But there are a lot of aspects here. How is the wellbore? Okay, if it's for example a deviated, okay, if it's horizontal. Okay. 
the completion and the type of equipment that it has inside. What is the well architecture? What is the configuration of the well? What kind of equipment does it have installed that it will facilitate taking out the fluids? Or, for example, what kind of what kind of equipment it will have if something happens? If, for example, water begins to come from the water from the aquifer to directly to the well, how we can stop that process? Okay, how we can avoid that that will happen? So that's the completion. Something very important for development, of course, is the well cost. And also if we have, if, is the reservoir strong enough to produce from the beginning with no artificial lift, with no help? Or if we have to put some kind of energy inside the well to produce the fluids, because it's not enough the natural, uh, with natural depletion. So that's um, uh, artificial lift. Also the location of the well, the length of the well, the how are the wells located with each other to rec to maximize recovery, that's also very important. Now we go a bit further and we go to the part on the network. Or I call it network or flow lines, pipelines. or also called network. Is the, the, the set of pipes and the set of flow lines and the set of conduits that we use to take the, f the, the fluid further from the wellhead to the processing facilities. Sometimes in some systems that is very short, okay, that really doesn't play a role, that is very small, but some cases we need long transportation distances and in most subsea applications we need long transportation distances and uh, and that's also then it's important to take into account to see at the pressure drop in these distances that they are properly sized the temperature drop also if the temperature drops very much we begin to have problems okay we might have some flow assurance problems like wax or hydrates <coughs> uh, insulation and that depends pretty much on that, in a way, as I mentioned before, is locked on where the reservoir is. If it's offshore if, and if it's ultra deep, there is not much you can do. You are kind of locked. There are, of course, different concepts, but of course, you have to do the development offshore. Okay. If you are on land, but if you are, for example, in the Amazonian forest, then you have to do some kind of development. You cannot just go and placing wells all wherever you want. Otherwise, Greenpeace is going to come and you know give you a fine. Or if you are, for example, in the desert in Saudi Arabia, maybe you cannot drill a well because it's a desert. And if you put a well, maybe it will be covered after some time with sand. You will not be able to find it. So there are many things that the the surface part is of, is affected by the geography. And then finally, the process which its main function is to stabilize that gas and oil that we are getting from the reservoir. <laughs> And we will see later, we of course we are going to go a bit into the details of the process. We will see later that the process from the field performance point of view, really the main or the main problem or the main effect that it has on the production of the field is on the capacity. Okay, that tells us how much we can process per day. And that's really the limitation. If you want to get, for example, more from the field, you say, okay, I'm a very, you know, I'm going to propose a very good uh, measure for the company. I want to in, 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 increment in 20% the production. But then you go and ask the production engineer, how much can we process? Can we process 20% uh, more? And the guy says, no, we don't have capacity. We are already bottlenecked by the water production. So really there is not much that you can do and that's a decisive factor. So in that part, in that respect, in the field performance part, the, the process, we of course we will see now, it's, um, 
we will see now how it works, but uh, it's mainly on the capacity, on the processing capacity that is available. Okay. So let's take now a break, and when we come back, we will um, we will continue. Class late. So I have to bring some candy or something, I guess, to keep you here. Okay. So. Yeah, so that's um, most of the things that play a role in the field performance. Okay, but re in reality, in the in the industry, in the companies, we use different software to let's put it a bit smaller. We use different software, specialized software, to compute the field performance. Okay, so in the reservoir side, we have uh, we have the most known reservoir simulator, Eclipse. Okay. We also have CMG. Eclipse has two versions, uh, compositional and black oil. We have CMG. We have also Moore. <coughs> we have also Sensor. Some companies have their own uh, reservoir simulator. Uh, you can also use some people use if it's very simple and it you know it's not too complicated the the structure of the reservoir some people use use material balance again for that they use different other type of software other family of software like uh, one example is embal Eclipse is from uh, Slumberger, uh, CMG is a Canadian company, Moore is from, anyone knows? Moore? Yeah. Sensor is from Coates Engineering, uh, Embal is from uh, Petroleum Experts. There is also another material balance program called SOS. So software. Uh, then uh, also some, especially for for wells in the U.S. for gas wells in the U.S. They don't like to go to any of these complicated uh, uh, software, so they just use decline curve analysis. Okay, or called DCA. Then on the wellbore side, we don't have that many options. We have Prosper. We have PipeSim. Prosper again from Petroleum Experts. Uh, pipes. Oh, we have also one more software called Resolve. Uh, no, uh, Review. That's from Petroleum Experts. There might be more, then there are also some companies that they have their in-house simulator. The in-house Chevron, I think they have their own in-house simulator. Uh, uh, Prosper, Petroleum Experts, Pipesim from Sumberger. Then you have another one that is called Pipeface. That's, I think, the, the, the wellbore simulator of um, Chevron. And there is one more. Forgot now. I think it's by Halliburton. Then on the network, also we don't have too many options. We have um, a pipe sim again. We have uh, Gap from the same people, Petroleum Experts. And there is again this simulator that I don't remember uh, from Halliburton. And from the process, we have. HiSys and Unisim and we might have some others and they are used mainly to model the process but also sometimes to model a bit of the production system up to the network flow lines they are sometimes used for that so as you see they are different depending on the each one of these areas is almost a department in the oil company and they use their own simulators and they have the old, their own preferred tools. So you see already that there is a challenge. If you want to see how the field is going to perform, 
that you have a challenge to unify all of these people and get all the input from all of these simulators to get how the field is going to, to perform, okay? So for that, we have a new family or it relatively new because it's something, a science that has been, a science or a, f or a sector that has been uh, developed in the last years that is called IAM, Integrated Asset Modeling. And in that family of, uh, of programs, we have Resolve from Petroleum Experts. We have IAM, that was formerly Avocet, was the name, from Slumberche. We have, for example, Pipit, that we have almost, you know, we are very lucky because we have a license for most of these products here at the Institute. Uh, Pipit, and I think that's all. Okay, we are going to try to touch some of these, not so much on the reservoir simulation, but more on the on the production system. And that means we will try to use, uh, we hope to get, I hope to cover enough to go and uh, be able to do some examples with Embal and uh, Prosper and Gap. Okay, but we will work very much, that's for sure, with Heises. But we hope to have time to, I hope that we will have time to, to see some of the other software just to that you will be aware of that okay <coughs> so as I told you before uh, you see from this uh, let's just make a summary of the which type of ki of skills are we going to exercise in this course and develop, those of you who don't have it. Okay, so we have some technologies that are specific to oil and gas. Those of you coming from our department, the, you, you already have a strong background. Those of you coming outside of the department, you will have to do some effort to catch up. Okay, and here we have a field architecture. You have to be get familiar with uh, how many of you took the course of Sigbjorn Sangensland or are taking it this semester, subsea production systems. Okay, so we have, so we don't have to repeat some of the information. Architecture, okay, field architecture, then well technology. Then process and flow, that's a very important part. Control and instrumentation. And uh, offshore technology, as our course is focused on offshore, and there are many things. The marine aspect is very important and very relevant, and sometimes is what defines how our production system is going to look like, what is the architecture of our production system. So we have to touch a little bit, and we hope to do that by the end, on offshore uh, considerations, offshore technologies. Okay, so some things that are more generic are, we are going to use some engineering. Engineering uh, courses. And that will be basic uh, fluid mechanics. Okay, thermodynamics. Uh, some, of course, some math and data handling. Some statistics. 
and at the end some economical analysis. Okay. So, uh, and as I told you, some of the, I will try to bring up those of you who don't have the knowledge, I will try to bring you up to level, but the idea is not that some of you know already the topic and some of you don't know. So one part is bored in class and the other part is just listening. So I, I'm, I'm planning those things that are very basic just to point you to the right uh, video or the right source to, to get up to date. Uh, yes, so now let's uh, look at the final part of this course. Let's talk about the production uh, profile, okay? Or that's something to define how much are we going to produce or to determine how much are we going to produce each year. That's also called production scheduling. And that's to say how much not only the field is going to produce, but also each individual will. And why is that, that important? Because Reservoir engineers, they, when they analyze the data and they analyze the model, they say, if we want to achieve certain recovery factor, we run the model. Remember all, also that all of these models that we have set here, they represent some kind of virtual image of the field. It's much better if you are going to develop an asset to have a virtual representation and be able to deplete it one, twice, three times, ma as many times as possible to determine what is the best strategy to execute in real life. Okay, that's the actual, besides from all the other problems, to analyze other operational problems, etc. One of the main reasons to have this model of the field is just to be able to deplete it multiple times, okay, until you find, you lock on the best way to deplete the asset. The best way, that one that gives you the highest MPV, the one that gives you the highest recovery factor. Did I put this? the one that gives you the highest recovery factor, etc. So maybe the reservoir engineer that is doing the analysis is determining, okay, if I want to get a recovery factor of 50% from this field, I have to take this much, this much, this much, and this much from these wells. Okay? And they are giving a suggestion how to produce the field. Of course, they give the suggestion how to produce it, and then they come to the people in the well and the network to say, does the reservoir has enough energy to flow, to take, to actually produce this rate. And if it doesn't have, then the people again from the wells and from the network say, no, sorry, it cannot deliver this rate. So they have to go back to their model to run the calculations and then come back with some new suggestions, okay? So that's what we are referring with production scheduling and production profile. <coughs> so let's to let's make a drawing, a simplified drawing of a production system. So let's say we have the well here. We're going to make it very simple, just vertical well. And we have the reservoir, we put it like a cylinder or like a slab where the fluid is flowing from certain reservoir pressure to the well bore. Okay. And here we have an important point of pressure that we call, that is inside the well but it's just next to the sand face, it's just next to the reservoir and that's called PWF flowing bottom hole pressure.
Now we put the surface. And then here at the top of the reservoir, we are going to put another very important pressure point, which is the wellhead pressure. And then right there, we have in the well, we have something, a control element that is a restriction that we say is the production choke. It's a valve that can regulate, it's a restriction, a flow restriction, of a valve that can regulate the rate that we are producing from the field. Then it continues, you have flow line or a pipeline and then that goes to us to something called a separator from where we get separator from where we get a uh, oil water if there is any water or gas, if there is any gas. The separator is, the separator is, maybe the analogy is not, uh, I will get into trouble, but it's like, we Catholics, we say that, you know, Jesus is our anchor, okay? The separator is the anchor of the production system. If you are hoping, you know, things are changing, some people, for them is the sun, for some other people is some other things. If, if, if you want to anchor something, the only thing that will not change, or that will remain constant, no matter what you do, is the separator. The separator pressure. So we, I like to refer it like the, is the anchor or, or is the immovable thing of the production system. No matter what you do, it's all the time going to keep constant this pressure at the separator. Why? Because the people that design the process, chemical engineers, process engineers, they don't like changes. They are not like this guy that this pressure can go, the, for the production engineer, the pressure can go up and down, okay? The wellhead pressure. Well, it doesn't matter too much. If that happens to the chemical engineer, they are very picky. So they say, we don't want any changes, any, nothing. Okay, that has to be constant. We cannot allow, because here I'm putting something very simple, but here comes a very complicated process of a lot of stages and a lot of things happening there that they want to have, that the inlet will be all the time at the fixed uh, pressure. So for that, they, I'm going to put a very simple drawing. You have a floater that is registering here, the level, okay? And you have also the pressure. And you have two control valves in each line. Let's say here this is a simplified example, oil and some liquid and, and gas, but you might have the three phases. Okay, and you have, let me just put it down. You have a controller that goes to the valve and this controller that goes to the oil valve. So what happens if the pressure begins to increase? I'm saying I have too much gas in my separator. So what do I have to do? I just have to open the gas valve, right? But if I have, let's say the level is going up I don't want the level to go up because if this goes up, maybe I will have some liquid drag to the to to the gas. And remember, the chemical engineer don't like changes. They want they are expecting only gas at this point. If it comes with some droplets of liquid, you're going to get a hard time. You're going to get a, 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 a shout. So um, so in that case, that that valve is going to open to be able to that the level will go down again. Okay. Other thing that we have, okay, so that's a simplified version of our production system. In a way, okay, you have the reservoir, you have the well, you might have many wells, but we are going to now take out that complexity for now. We have the flow line and we have the separator. Now, if you put a person here and you tell him, please monitor how much is coming out of our system. You put an engineer here. 
and you say please tell me how do I account what is coming out of the system what unit do you see that is commonly used for accounting for the production of a field what unit do we use huh? we use a volume unit surface volume unit okay if you come here and put a mechanical engineer what is he going to tell you he's going to tell you they are passing so many kilograms per second or so many kilograms per hour does that tell you something can you multiply that times the dollar okay it takes some time you might do it but that guy is going to get fired okay the mechanical engineer now you go and hire another guy and that's a chemical engineer and you ask him how much is passing through the line how much am I selling and that guy goes to the manager and says okay we are having so many kilogram mole per second what's going to happen with that guy with the chemical engineer is going to get fired again so then finally comes okay we're going to get one good uh, petroleum student or one good student from NTNU what is that guy going to tell the boss the manager how many what if when he asks how much oil is passing through it standard cubic meters per day okay. or a standard barrels per day okay or it's going to say standard cubic feet per day if it's gas the guy is going to use a standard volume a volume at standard conditions and that might be for some of you who are not from petroleum that might be a bit complicated but that's they are just all equivalent units okay let's say a volume you say okay the volume is affected by pressure and temperature so why are we using volume these guys petroleum engineers are using volumes for to report a rate and I'm telling you that it's exactly the same the only thing is that's because why because it's easy something that you sell if you have a volume you put it in a barrel and you know exactly that you will get today's what's the price 32 okay uh, dollars per barrel so you know exactly what you will get <coughs> okay so be be aware of that now let's make an analogy of this production system to another simpler system that it might be more intuitive to see what happens okay analogy Okay, and that's simply a tank, a tank with some restrictions. So let's say now that the production system is a tank. Okay, the reservoir is actually a tank. That is holding a certain reservoir pressure. We know that might not be the case because we know that there are some, there is not connected, might not be connected the reservoir, it doesn't have exactly that shape, but now only to simplify things, we're going to say the reservoir is just a tank. A, ve a metal vessel that is confined and just we make a hole in it very small and then we take now the fluid to go from the reservoir from the bottom hole to the wellhead it has to go overcome some hydraulic losses okay some pressure losses I hope all of you are familiar with pressure losses yeah okay <laughs> if you were going to say no I was going to cry so okay so you have it's like if you all of those pressure losses we can represent them with a restriction with a big restriction we put something that stocks in the pipe and this is representing all the pressure loss in the tubing no, but we are forgetting something right is that after the reservoir directly goes the pressure drop in the tubing? What what am I missing? So why nobody told me anything? Okay. One thing, this pressure here we said that is bottom hole pressure. Okay, so we are already this is wellhead pressure. We are missing one pressure in this diagram, which is the bottom hole pressure. Okay? So we have first to have the pressure loss from here to the well. Okay? That is called the drawdown. That is, if I want to produce certain rate, I have to put certain bottom hole pressure to get that production. So that, let's move it upwards. I can do that. You have to erase. Maybe I have to use another page. So 
So I have here, that's a drawdown. We call it drawdown, is the pressure drop, pressure loss in the formation. And that's where it comes that the, if you have a high permeability, if the, 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 the pore size is very big and you have a good flow, then that is very small. But if you have a very tight formation, then that one will be, restriction will be bigger and bigger. So here you have is the bottom hole flowing pressure, PWF. And then after that, you have another restriction, which is the tubing. And now let's say we have a, something that I call a choke, right? It's something I told you is like a valve. So why not put a valve? Okay, it's like that, it's a restriction, but I can change the size and I can make it bigger or, or smaller. So how do we put a valve? Like that. And we say that's the choke. Then we have, what do we have here? We have wellhead pressure. Then we have another losses that represent the losses where? The flow line and pipeline. And then we have a fixed pressure. Constant. Okay, we have a fixed pressure. So that tank, in a way, in a very simplistic way, it represents exactly like, like our production system. There are two ways to produce a field. Two ways, two modes. Mode A. So just to be, just to maybe to, to play with your intuition. So what happens, I'm producing the choke is at a fixed position. I'm producing uh, a rate. What will happen with the rate that I report here with time? Decreases. It decreases, okay? Be why? Because what is defining the rate through the system is the difference in pressure between the reservoir pressure and this constant pressure. Yeah? In a way, the rate through the system is, is in a way proportional or is defined by the PR minus P separator. Okay? This one is constant, P separator, but the reservoir is declining all the time. Why? Because we are just taking material out of it. So if you plot that, and you just leave the choke open, you should have something like this, okay, with time. Now, I tell you that there are two ways, and that's something that you have to, has to stay with you from this uh, course. There are two ways to produce a field. One of them is mode A, or that is constant rate and one of them is mode B that is constant pressure this the, it requires a constant adjustment of the choke And we will see very quickly why. And this one doesn't require, choke is not adjusted. Or we can say choke is left at a fixed position. And how does it look like? The rate versus time, it can look like that, for example, is constant. And then at some point, always, no matter what, mode A enters into mode B. You might try, but all the time, mode A goes to mode B. It's just nature, okay? And we will see a bit later why. But you might have that, or you might have, for example, that you might produce less, but then you produce for longer. That's kind of an intuitive idea, right? If I produce a lot, but very early, uh, but if I produce a lot, I will somehow reach the end of the plateau early. But if I produce less, then I will be able to prolong the plateau. 
Okay, that intuitively you have that idea, but you don't know still, you don't know really yet why. Okay, so that's how it looks like. And at this point, what happens at this point? What is your intuition telling you? How do I keep a constant rate? By the choke. Hmm? By the choke. What do I have to do with the choke to keep a constant rate? Increase, but increase the choke. Do I buy a new choke and put it there? Huh? Adjustment, okay. What do I do with the choke? If you see like a valve, okay, the choke is something like that. It's not exactly, uh, actually, it's not like this, but we are just going to use a simplification, okay. If we, what happens with the choke? If we want to create less restriction to keep the same rate, remember this one is going down okay pr minus p separator is all the time going down so the rate should go down so what should i do this restriction i should make it smaller and smaller so i should open and open and open the choke okay with time but there comes a time that's why it stops because there comes a time where the choke cannot be any more opened okay it's already fully open so that's where i reach that point and then i have a decline of the rate choke fully Open. Okay. If I want to say, let's say I want to implement that system here, I can take a copy maybe. So if I have space, so fully open. Okay, let's say, let's take this example here and let's put a flow meter. Okay, I can put here FM, that stands for flow meter, FM, and it, still I keep the pressure constant, but then I take a line, control line that goes back to the choke, and I'm measuring all the time the rate, and if the rate begins to decrease, I begin to open, 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 until it reaches fully open. Where do I use this type of uh, production profile? When do I produce my field like that? When you have a constrained capacity. Okay, but uh, if I can, let's say I'm planning the field, okay? So I can decide if to put 1 million capacity plant or half a million or 100,000. So I can choose. I'm developing the field. So when do I use this and not the other one? Of course, there is also not something in mind. All the time I'm interested in recover as soon as possible, okay? When I recover as soon as possible, the discount factor on this thing, we go back and back and back and back, okay? They are, the discount factor is going to be, if I recover as soon as possible, it's better, okay? So why to put a plateau when I know that I will not be recovering everything very quickly, but I will take delay the time when I use this approach? Limitation in capacity, but why do you want to buy, for example, why do you, what is it, the factor that makes, okay, I don't want to buy a 1 million barrel facility, but a 100,000 million barrel, the cost, okay? It's much more expensive to buy 1 million barrel capacity than 100,000, okay? And also, also what we, is related to the aspect that we mentioned before. If we want to produce more and more, my plateau will be shorter and shorter. That means if, let's say, I buy a 1 million barrel capacity, but then I'm able to use it only for one year, and the rest is going to decline, it doesn't make any sense, right? I want, if I paid a lot of money for this million barrel facility, I want to use it for as long as possible, yeah? So that is, when do I use this concept? Use it for a new development or standalone development that doesn't depend, doesn't have any, it's a field that doesn't have anything, you cannot tie it to any other facility. For example, what is typically done in the North Sea is that you have a field, but then you have some other facilities where the field is already in depletion. Okay, already the, the facilities have extra capacity to handle fluid. So you send the line there and you say, okay, I'm going to process with the extra capacity that that facility has. 
But when I'm standalone, I'm in a standalone field, I don't have anything close, I just have to de develop everything standalone, then in that case I have to build my own facilities and in that case I choose mode A. Okay, and here I have to, of course, build the infrastructure from scratch. Okay. And then I have the other way of producing that is as much as possible, as early as possible open choke case. In that case, just the profile goes like that, open choke, or choke in a fixed position. And this is kind of the greedy approach. I want to recover as much as possible, as fast as possible. When should I use this approach? I already told you the answer. This approach is used for satellite fields, fields that are satellite or that are adjacent or they are close to an existing field and the other field is mature and is already declining, has extra capacity. So for a satellite field to tie in to an existing field And in that case, you don't have to build the infrastructure, okay? No need for new infrastructure. So I think I won't be able to cover all I had for the class, but let's go before you go. Let's you, I thought, did you bring the computer? Most of you? Yeah, so let's go very quickly to a field simulator that I have made for you. Okay, you go to my website. It's, uh, you can find that on uh, INSIDA, those of you who've ha who have access, in resources, under the left, resources. Then you go to my website, here and you click on the link. Or those of you who are quick, you can just type www.ipt.ntnu.no slash snake stanko slash. Okay. You will be referred to this site. Now you click on resources. Review there. Okay, so now you go to useful links and tools, the first link, operate a field using the field simulator. Okay, and you get this screen. So let's, that's a field and that has real equations, gas equations, very simple, but has real gas equations on it. And it has some in input information that maybe won't, won't, go so, won't go so much in detail now, but it has how the reservoir is going to decline the pressure with the material that I'm taking, that's represented by this number, very small and negative number. Then you have the initial reservoir pressure, how much is contained in the in the tank. Then the these two variables they are representing the resistance. Those two those things that I show here, those represent these numbers represent the resistance, and we will talk a bit more in detail about it. That's the number of steps that I'm going to simulate, and that's how many days there are in one step. So here, you see I'm simulating 20 years. So let's change it to 40, and say 40 half a years, 180. I have seven wells, let's say that I have started, my production system has seven wells, and it's going to remain like that for the whole life of the field, and initially I'm going to operate at the medium choke opening. Okay, so let's see 
it works. All of, is it working for all of you? Yeah. Okay, so you will see the decline because the choke, I'm not changing the position of the choke. Okay. Now, what happens if I want to keep the rate constant? What do I have to do? Okay, I have to open the choke. Okay, I have to be careful because it's very sensitive to the choke. Okay, just try it by yourself that you have to open the choke to keep the rate constant. Uh, we can try to do it that from the beginning if you want to keep the rate constant so we keep again the choke in the middle then start okay just to get our initial rate that let's say is a bit more than one point than 15 million and then i begin to open open Okay, taking too long the animation. Okay, now when I come to this point, I don't have any more control. And now it's going to go on decline. Because now when I reach the maximum choke opening, now I don't have any more control and it's going to begin to decline the production. Okay. Now we are finished for today. We have only one minute left. So let's make a summary. I just gave you an introduction of the course. I told you where are we where are we going to look at in this course, what uh, specific where and when uh, is this field development and operations, what kind of aspects are we going to analyze, and then we begin to see this that is very important that you understand from the beginning that we have two operational modes. We have one mode which is mode A constant rate and mode B constant pressure. So your task for today, before tomorrow, if you have free time, you are bored, you know, you don't want to watch any sitcoms or any TV series, you have to play a bit more with the, with the simulator, okay? There is also possible to change the number of wells, and that's actually what happens. When you start the system, usually you start it with the minimum number of wells, and then you begin to add and tie in more wells and more wells, put them in operation, and you will see that the production begins to jump and increase, okay? So please... On, make sure that you understand the, the simple example, you play a bit with that, and if you have any questions, you can, you know, bring them tomorrow to class. Okay, before we finish, close the session. Any question? No? Okay, so see you tomorrow.